All right, if the panelists can come up here, we can get started. And I'll give you one of the mic. Okay, pass around the mic. All right, I think we are about to get started. Um, this is not a very, very long discussion. We thought we'll give you a little bit of a breather from all the talks coming at you. Um, we'll have conversations and we've kept it purposely slide free so that you can chat and we can chat. Um, so I'm really pleased and honored that we have a, a, a great set of panel here. Um, you will notice there's a slight change on the panel too because there was a swap over and Shashi, we convinced him to come to the all hands. So we got him on the panel and Don unfortunately couldn't be here because uh, he had a flight cancellation. So he uh, he had to miss it. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce our panelists and then you know, we'll start the conversation. Uh, some of you may remember it from last year, we did something similar about multidisciplinarity, which is a hallmark in IHARP. Um, and you know some of them already, but I'll just uh, mention Dr. Matthew Morlingham. He's professor at Dartmouth in Earth Sciences and co-PI on IHARP and co-director. So you've heard some of his work already. Uh, uh, Christine Kirkpatrick, she's the division director at San Diego Supercomputing. And you heard all the fun questions from Christine about data because she oversees the data services division there. And she's been involved in EarthCube and all kinds of earth science fun stuff. So we'll hear more about that. Um, and then Shashi uh, Shekhar, who's also co-PI on IHARP, as you know, um, is a distinguished professor at University of Minnesota. What many of you may already know, and if you don't know, he is also the PI for a new AI Institute on uh, climate for agriculture. Um, so you'll hear some of them, some of the things from them. So what the way we'll do it is we'll do it uh, free flow. Uh, I have some prepared questions, but I would love to invite your questions based on what you heard earlier and what you hear here. So each of the panelists will briefly introduce themselves talking about, they'll give an example of a multidisciplinary project that they've been on, maybe share an experience from that. Um, but just introduce yourself and then share something about a multidisciplinary project that you have been involved in. Thank you, Vandana. So I thought hard about this question because in a way, glaciologists, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but we are always working on multidisciplinary projects. Like none of us are specialists in anything, but we, like I, I feel like I am a, a, not great at math, not great at physics. I'm not a good programmer. But I know enough of each of these disciplines to try to push the envelope a little bit. Uh, but two projects came to mind still. Uh, so th there is a project that I've been working on for many years called GREAT. So the idea is to try to determine how fast Greenland has been changing over the, the past 15,000 years. And in the on the team, there is there are geologists, there are atmospheric scientists, there's ice core people, there is a few ice sheet modelers like me. And like any inter interdisciplinary work is extremely, well, I was going to say challenging, but challenging is not the right word. It, we, we all need to be patient, right? There is, we all need to know what, uh, what is perfectly established, what, where are the, what is uncertain, how we can we establish the same language and target a question that's of interest to um, all of us. Another project, since I know Vandana said only one, but I can I can help myself, uh, that Chengong is involved in um, is called DJ for Earth. And uh, yeah, Chengong is already laughing. DJ for Earth is a great project. Have you guys heard about Julia, the new programming language? So Julia, the idea is as simple as Python or MATLAB to code, but it's the speed of C. And what Julia does is it, it, it integrates seamlessly traditional computing methods and machine learning within the same language. So you can create a new ice sheet model, say, and put a neural network for the processes that you don't know well and sort of train your a term in your partial differential equations based on observations. So it's, it's really cool on paper. So the, the, what we uh, struggle a bit on this in, in this 
project is we're working with tools that are being developed as we work on them. So we're working with computer scientists, we're working with Julia developers, and we all have uh, you know, different objectives. For us, we're interested in the science. We wanna see, do we learn something new about physical processes? But for them, it's what's the performance? You know, do we beat uh, Python or is there... Um, anyway, so we have, we have different objectives, but what we're trying to do is in the long term, we all learn something interesting and that's beneficial to all of us. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Hi, so uh, Christine Kirkpatrick, thank you for the nice introduction, Vandana. Um, in addition to being at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, I have a few other hats. Uh, one of them is being Secretary General of the International Science Council's Committee on Data, aka CoData. Uh, and I also uh, represent GoFair US, which is devoted to um, helping organizations and projects and researchers implement the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Not all of my projects are multidisciplinary. Uh, it's only a matter of the ratio of how many people are like me versus not. I work on a lot of projects where I'm kind of the weirdo. And, you know, I listen with the my the way I see the world and try and um, understand and adapt with the, the different domain scientists I'm working with. Uh, Vandana mentioned EarthCube. So that was a 10-year project uh, portfolio of projects from the National Science Foundation that tried to get geoscientists and cyber infrastructure people uh, to work closely together. And I'll give some examples as we get into the other questions about that. I have a new um, award, well, newish, um, from the from the NSF, a research uh, coordination network that's um, called the acronym is FAR, which stands for the intersection of FAIR uh, and machine learning, AI readiness, and AI reproducibility. And um, I guess because we didn't want something that was easy, we said that we were going to try and bridge between um, computer scientists, um, research data people, and uh, geoscience. So, <laughs> but uh, it's been it's been fun and rewarding, but also really challenging to uh, you know I say I'm a computer scientist, but to um, try, try well Beth will know try to integrate the computer science world into some of these other topics. Can it's it's a real culture clash. And uh, yeah, anyway, all my projects are multidisciplinary. All right, so, uh, so you know, my interdisciplinary journey started about 35 years ago because there were, you know, so I was interested in societal problems and, uh, and they're more exciting than just doing, you know, just advancing your own discipline. And, and there are a few ways to state it, but I will use uh, something from the AI Institute request for proposal. And I think it distills it very well because federally also this terminology has been evolving since late 90s. Right? So if you look at the AI Institute solicitation, it actually talks about three types of AI. Okay? First, it says applied artificial intelligence, in which case you are taking a off the shelf you know, AI technique and you're using it to solve a new problem. So for example, CNN, or you know, we, we might use to model, let's say some properties of ice. Right? And AI Institute proposal actually said they didn't want to fund that. So they said, stay away from that. Right? <laughs> okay. Then, uh, then they talk about foundational AI, which basically means that you take the AI, you know, theory or models or methods. These are words from the solicitation, and you make, strengthen them, make them stronger. Right. So, um, and but that could be done just for the sake of the next generation AI. And they also said they didn't, you know, necessarily want to fund just that. I mean, that could be part of the proposal, but they also wanted to see what they said use inspired AI. And that's, I think, the very most interesting part. And the way, you know, it is couched that it, it has to advance the use, you know, case, and it has to advance the AI. So you have to do it both. And that, I think, is the crux of, you know, successful collaboration. You have to find a win-win where both sides are advanced. Right? Uh, so from AI Institute proposal, one example of that you will hear tomorrow, which is uh, knowledge-guided machine learning. And Vipin had, you know, a lot of us actually went down that path about 10 years ago. Vipin was leading an expedition on uh, data-driven understanding of climate change. And um, by the end of that project, we more or less realized that pure data-driven approach could only go so far. You needed to learn some physics, but pure physics-driven approach also was hitting some bottlenecks. So you had to leverage ideas from both sides, right? And uh, in fact, this morning also you heard physics-inspired neural network is another variation on that. 
but physics is not the only uh, physical science. You can get ideas from chemistry and biology and elsewhere. Um, and, and then you'll see a whole lot more detail. But, but if you look at this situation, there are two things happening. One, from the domain perspective, you are probably improving at least the interpretation, hopefully also the prediction. Right? So it benefits the use case or the domain. But it is also strengthening the foundational AI part because the pure machine learning, uh, at least neural network part, has some Achilles heel because you're training them on benchmarks. Benchmarks are not always representative of all possible situations. So when you go out of sample, all bets are off what your machine learning model will do. But when you bring in theories from physics or other sciences, uh, you might generalize a little bit better out of sample. So it is strengthening AI, you know, foundational AI, and it is helping use case, and that's a win-win. And in my mind, no, that is the crux. Now, the second part I want to add is finding this win-win, you need patience, as we heard, you know. And many times you have to iterate because each side is very good at figuring out the questions which can benefit that, you know, that single side. You can either advance use case or advance your computational, you know, tools. Those are easier, but if you want to find a question which advances both, you may have to iterate two, three, four times. And you know, if you want some other time, I can tell you that story in context of Iger, where you know we had to go back and forth three, four, five times each time. We knew one side could advance, but it was not clear if the other side will benefit. So main thing there is that you have to have trust, you have to have patience. But once you find a win-win question, then I think it really helps move things forward. And this project, you know, Anisha and I, we are doing the same. That's great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if people already have questions for our panelists, um, but I have a, a question to see this. Oh, okay, Gianna, do you want to maybe we could directly go up to that? Yeah, my question is uh, how, how much uh, effort you have to spend to, to learn knowledge of the other discipline you work with? Because you, 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 probably already feel overwhelmed to learn the advances of your own discipline to learn like for me to learn Apollo science is because you are not trained with such a even foundations it takes a very long time and, and so what what do you have any suggestions or examples on that yes so i don't know if we have anyone who's uh works on metabolomics in the audience Anyone can spell it? Okay, it's pretty hard. <laughs> so I've been part of uh, the Metabolomics Workbench um, Lab for, I want to say, I don't know, eight or nine years. And it took me the first four years before I understood fully what people were talking about. And fully might be a stretch, but so metabolomics, um, it's kind of like what it sounds like, but you take analytical chemistry and you throw in some biology and bioinformatics and you get it's a very uh, niche area. It's very important, I think, to understanding all these other things that we were pinning our hopes on genomics and microbiome, like it's a component of that. But um, the hardest part, they didn't have any introductory books. When I, when I joined the lab, I bought the couple textbooks that they even had titles like Introduction to Metabolomics. BS, they were a bunch of papers that were just published into a book and they were totally incomprehensible. And so over the years of going to the different meetings, uh, I've tried to nudge people saying we really need introductory curriculum, like you need to attract more people into this field because also when people can't understand something, the field really narrows. And so I'd say that's that's kind of the worst case. But I think the best case is doing what, you know, Vandana and others are hosting and you're hosting this, you know, these two days is to get us together, have us sit through things we don't totally understand and slowly you start to absorb. Okay, I was thinking about two other things. Um, the first one is jargon. Jargon is really an acronyms, I guess I would put it in the same spot. It really prevents us from understand, understanding each other. And we're so used to use, you know, these terms or acronym that it's also hard for us to switch to a different language. So now I try hard whenever I talk to people that are, you know, not in my discipline to not use these terms or to explain. And the second thing that has helped me in the past is to ask stupid questions. And the longer you wait, the more embarrassing it becomes. You know, when you're like, hey, well, I'm not sure I understand what an epoch is. And you've been talking for a year, and now you understand that it's, you know, a set of optimization steps. But so asking stupid questions, whenever you're like, wait, I'm lost. I don't know what you're talking about. You should do it right away and not let go until you actually understand. 
So, so I'll add just a little bit, you know, as Matthew said, if you can find literature which is written for broad audience, that, that speeds things up, right? And there are such literature, you know, the, the simplest one is New York Times science section. Believe it or not, they do discuss quite a few of the latest debates in science, right? National Academy reports, and I really love them. And uh, they are also pretty much, you know, tracking things, what's happening. You heard Professor Anup Anupama Prakash talk about the polar board, right? So in fact, when, uh, you know, Vandana's email came, do you want to help with IHAR proposal? I mean, those were the first things I went and checked, you know, what is, what is the agenda they think is there, right? Is this proposal aligned with their agenda? So there is literature which is written for broad audience, even and scientifically reasonable literature, right? But within the group also, it helps. For example, within IHARP early on, we were giving talks to each other and the expectation was that it will be at a level that everybody can understand. Uh, I, I didn't see a lot of that happening during IHARP proposal. So in fact, I had asked and maybe Vandana or Mariam connected me to uh, one of the uh, postdocs in Colorado and we used to meet weekly to actually have a conversation so we could figure something out, right? Uh, but for the AI climate, we did that for more than a year where we were meeting weekly, two hours, and people were sort of just giving, you know, talk about what they do in language which others can understand. So a whole lot of that was happening, you know, during pre-proposal, proposal writing. Uh, so, so essentially, yeah, we can read books, we can take courses, but at this level, if you trust someone, then maybe have each other, you know, give short presentations in a language and ask lots of questions, right? Because vocabulary matters. Uh, the simple thing, right, Anish and I, we were working and the word outlier <laughs> means different, right? Yeah. Anomaly means differently in the climate and in uh, data mining and so on. Yeah, I just wanted to add to uh, one other thing. So you do leave people behind between the disciplines, but you also leave people behind uh, early career to later career. And we sometimes take uh, for granted some of those things. Uh, when we had the EarthCube office, we would hear from people senior in their career and say, you know, I, I never learned Python. Like, I don't know what a container is. I, I only, I learned MATLAB. So like, help me out here. I want to catch up with everyone else. And through some of these different inputs, we came up with a jargon list. And so for every newsletter, we would include one or two of these words that had come up where people didn't understand. And sometimes we would find ones that confused us about the geosciences and we'd include those and we uh, compiled them all at the end of the project and they're on the website. Other questions from people? Yeah, question. I'm gonna try this. That's a mic too, by the way, a very nice mic. <laughs> This, oh, this is, this is really fun. <laughs> so I, I have a kind of an ill-formed question, but it's related to this topic. You know, in most of the research and most of the projects that I've been a part of up to IHARP, they're usually driven forward by an individual. Each one person bears a disproportionate amount of the load of carrying a project forward. But when you're doing interdisciplinary work, that that doesn't function because it requires having all of the perspectives together to actually solve the problem. It's more complicated. One person can't be the driving force. I'm just wondering if you've figured out through your your interdisciplinary work up to this point, how logistically do you manage a project in a way that that still allows for progress to be made, given that, in my experience, there's always one individual who really carries things forward on most projects or is the driving force behind them. Doing it as a team is a harder thing to do. And, and I feel like that's an area where I need to figure out how to be better. I'm not sure space. Oh, okay. I, I, I was thinking that I have all these tall words to comment, but um, I, I think this is very true and we've seen it in IHARP. Um, it does happen that when you start the project, it may be that one person is bearing the weight because they're explaining things and they're, you've been in there, Nick, you like explained so many things to us and we really appreciate the patience. But I think that's how it starts. But then somewhere along that co-production and co-development, uh, the, the weight shifts, at least that's what I've observed. And it's an organic process. I don't think you can force it. You do have to start from one domain, which kind of brings in the force. Like if there's a science question, I know at the beginning of IHARP, we were always asking anybody, do you have a science question for us? And I, I think Shashi will remember this. And we were like really trying to get to the meat of the science questions. And then once we identified those, we started saying, okay, here's a way that we could solve it. And then somebody will come back and say, no, that's not working and so on. So I think that's a back and forth 
core development and core writing. And during this push and pull, I think you also develop the trust that, you know, you know what, what we are developing is something good and it, it can have a real impact. It takes time. I think that's the big, big thing that I've learned is two years and we're we are now emerging into something really interesting and we're starting to see things. So, um... Okay, I'll, I'll add something. Uh, I think what really helped us on several projects is having students. Students are the glue between the different PIs that don't speak the same language and they're somewhere in the middle. We are also, we're all busy. You know, we when we have one hour to dedicate to the project a day, that's really the maximum we can uh, um, allocate. Students have so much time. Look at their calendars. It's it's amazing. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah. Anyway, students really act as that glue between the different uh, persons involved. I think, and we all want students to to be successful. Also, so we will dedicate time to them. So I'd add, uh, you know, team science is a thing that people study and and help other people do, and it's not at all a unique issue that you're describing. In fact, when um, we, I just finished an ASELNET project, which is NSF's international, from the International Programs Office, it's creating networks of networks. They make you do team science. Uh, whole cohorts have to go through uh, uh, team science training. Uh, so anyway, that just tells you, like, and those are the people that get the awards have to do that. Uh, on, on the projects I've been on, I, I find that sometimes the load might be imbalanced, but most of my projects are very much team team projects. Um, one very important component, and you can't afford this on smaller grants, is to have a project manager. Um, on my bigger projects, we always have a logic model where we know what do we want the lasting outcomes to be, like these lasting impacts, and then we work backwards. And the project manager is the person who keeps that roadmap and says, we said in year one, we were going to do these things. How are we setting up for our year two outcomes? H have we published our outputs? Um, those people are critical. And so if you don't have a project where someone's kind of running around and not nipping at heels too much, but you know, keeping everybody organized, then that's when I think it's tough. One thing I've done where people have, when they have tiny amounts of time, is we spend our project meetings actually brainstorming the meat of things. And then I use consultants, sometimes editors or science writers. Um, we'll bring in graphics people, and they do that kind of work and then bring it back and show it to other people. And when people have to go away and work on head down, head down work, it's not feeling clerical or like it's not defined. It's very focused. I think the main points are covered. I mean, I just wanted to paraphrase what Matthew said. Um, students, I would say, can live one thing, you know, which is hard for faculty members to do. We we have we are scattered across research and teaching and service and even research multiple projects. But a PhD student can focus on one problem for a couple of years at least, right? Uh, and that's what makes a difference. So. So really, if when you are moving forward with a specific paper or a specific idea, having good students and have them jointly advised. So people from different disciplines or different role, right? They jointly advise. And that's how the, the, the papers and all proceed very well. Right? But in a very large project like IHARP or AI Institute, you know, what you just heard from Christine, it's not just research, right? They expect education, you know, collaboration, nexus, the outreach, broadening participation. And clearly, these are very distinct roles. So there is no way one person. So AI Institute, they keep telling us PI does not have to be a superhuman, right? They, they have to make sure you know people get along and people are in happy mood, right? But you let people take their roles and and let them lead. And it doesn't matter whether they are young or they are you know senior. Uh, and you have to watch their natural passions. Clearly, some people will be a lot more passionate about science questions. Others will be passionate about education. But as you see their passions. Another colleague of mine says the collision of the willing. So if you have 30, 40, 50 people, you're not going to expect all of them to have same involvement. But maybe you know some of them have certain passion this year, others might come along next year. So you kind of look at that, and those are a lot of team science things, right? Uh, and top down, the, it's the vision thing. You remember our former president? And in big projects, that, that logic model that you heard, so oftentimes it works from there. So even in AI Institute, particularly those funded by Department of Agriculture, they wanted us to have an impact you know, in mind from day one. In fact, right after we were funded, first thing the program manager told us is that you can throw away the proposal now. <laughs> you know, we don't care what you wrote. Right? 
but set your third year, fourth year impact goal through a retreat. So we had a two day retreat, everybody thinking together. If we were successful beyond our wildest imagination, what could be the news headline in five, 10 years, right? And pick a couple of those moonshots, right? And that's third or fourth year, then work backwards, right? From impact to outcome, right? To output, to activities, to input. And, and we, we wrote, we had to deliver a strategic implementation plan doing that in 90 days. We have to revise it every year, right? So that's your top down thing. And in doing that, you can set the vision, right? We all have to head there. But the actual activities that you would actually pick, you have to align it with the passions of the people, right? Because you can't be completely top down, you can't be completely bottom up. And, and having a project manager and other support helps. Can I just say one more thing? And I think I've seen similar things in IHARP, and I'll, I'll pause after that. But I don't know if folks remember, but we had to do a similar exercise. We didn't have to throw away the proposal, but we did have to do a similar exercise of management plan and like the 90 day plan and so on. And that that was like pulling teeth. But the vision that you saw in the slides early in the morning, I think that has driven us. Everywhere we go, we say the same thing. That's the vision. That's what we want to achieve. So I think having that North Star is very important. I think there is some. Oh. Oh, oh, what? oh, okay. I, I like the other mic is better. So, anyway, so yeah, I think we all agree that the interdisciplinary work is what we should do. Uh, it opens a lot of new things and so on. This is, this is not debatable facts. Uh, it's just like I am missing in this panel two more chairs here one for a junior professor, assistant professor, and one for a student. And since they are not there, I will try to say what they would have said. I'm an assistant professor. I'm applying for tenure in my department, and I don't want to take risk. I'm a good computer scientist. I'm a good polar scientist. I'm going to focus on my things till I get tenure and get things there. Because if I do interdisciplinary, there's a high risk to me. What should I do? That's one thing. I'm a student. I'm going to graduate, looking for a job, academia or industry. If I work in interdisciplinary projects, I may publish in the other domain things that may not count to me much. So that may hurt me. You can say this is wrong, whatever, but this is some worries that would be if, if there are two more chairs here. Yeah. So, um, well, you, you heard from my colleague Attack. I'm from the San Diego Supercomputer Center. One of the things we do is we... Um, provide that piece when when you have people that are interested in working on something but don't want to lead it and we give it to research scientists because uh we're not trying to get tenure and so we can take on like i have a real passion for science coordination that's nothing that i could ever use to probably get tenure anywhere but that's okay because i work in an institution where that's rewarded so that's maybe what i'd say to the assistant professor is you know, get the money that will help you do the thing that you're, you know, follow the passion, but find partners who want to do that piece that is not going to really be rewarding at this point. And, and actually on the student side, we do end up hiring a lot of um, undergraduates at the supercomputing centers and at other, other advanced computing centers. So at least on the, the ones that are, are coming with the more technical focus, working on those projects can get them some real world experience that gets them over that first job kind of hurdle. But I don't know about the science side. Someone else would have to comment. It, it is a tough one. I'm not going to um, lie. But I think for, for the students, I think they're very excited. You tell them machine learning, climate change, they're in. And also, I, I think it, it feels nice for the students to feel like they belong. They're, they're, they're on the team. You know, it's not they're not, not alone by themselves in an office with no window. They get to come here and meet other students. So I think students get excited about this sort of projects, I would say. Now for assistant professors, I, I, I agree with you, but I also think that nowadays more and more NSF calls, NASA calls are at the boundary of the discipline. You know, business as usual, there is so many of us. Um, you, will, you will make progress, but it will be incremental. If you want groundbreaking discoveries, it's, it, it has to be um, multidisciplinary. So I'll, I'll just say one thing as a, a previous department chair and a current associate dean, I will not ask the junior faculty member to lead a big, big project like this or write big projects like this. You want to focus on your careers and like the, the smaller uh, successes. But at the same time, we have uh, assistant professors who found niches 
uh, like what Shashi was saying, really driving their passion and what makes them excited. Uh, and I think Matthew hit the nail on the head because students are really passionate about these types of topics. So in a way, it's a good thing for us to attract students in it. The, the, the big thing comes down to us as faculty members is how we mentor those uh, students, you know, junior faculty members and researchers is do we give them the right direction? If they are overexcited and just doing outreach, maybe that's not the best thing. So we have to kind of steer them as well. Uh, so a lot comes down to mentoring as well, like where we we mentor them, but definitely not writing big, big grants in the first couple of years, maybe working with others and collaborating. Right. So so I will, you know, share also my own experience and, you know, Mohammed, Vipin, they all know. Uh, so Minnesota, you know, when I at least started interdisciplinary path, that's early 90s, computer science was not very interdisciplinary, right? Um, and in my own tenure, about one third of the faculty abstained. Vipin will probably remember. <laughs> Nobody said no because, but they abstained saying, are you a computer scientist? You know, that, that's the question that was asked. You seem to be spending too much time outside the department in, you know, Center for Transportation Study or GIS, right? Uh, but I, I think the lesson learned, which the department at Professor Same had told me that uh, whatever you are doing, you have to explain to your colleagues because they will vote on your tenure, right? Um, so you, they have to understand how you know the, the research is and so on. This has changed in computer science today, right? When you came up for tenure, Mohammed, it probably was the issue, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so of course, as a student professor, some people will vote, and they have to know what you are doing and why you know they they should respect that. You have to get letters. So, its key thing is that will you get you know the letter writers who can explain to people who are voting, right? So, be building those relationships. So, one good advice that Professor Sami gave me is that you pick two conferences, and he didn't care which two. He said, you pick your two conferences, but go there every year so that you build the relationship and you can get your six to 10 letter writers from there who understand your work and who can explain to you know, your colleagues. Right? So those are certainly important. Uh, and depending on the department, you know, some departments may not have the interdisciplinary openness. And if you are in a, such a place, and then it's important to get that early warning and then maybe you have to slow down your, you know, and do things which will get appreciated or, right? Uh, but there are plenty of departments today, you know, which are much more open-minded because if you look at federal funding situation, right, that Vandana was referring to, uh, the pasture strangle, 1997, a quad, pasture squadron, you know, the use inspired research has been uh, increasing in federal funding significantly, right? So when people look at NSF grants and so on, being interdisciplinary now is an advantage. You know, being in the, the pure research, you know, those resources are not growing as well, right? So, but you have to know your politics, you know, the mentoring committee, the department head, and they have to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and I can brief you on that because I was on the board for six years. <laughs> so so I, I know we could have a yeah. very nice, lively debate on it. I know Andy has a question. Can I read an online question, yeah. Andy, if that's okay? Uh, so Vandana, maybe just I will wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. So CRA actually has a memo for tenure and promotion. And if you look at that, they actually talk about, you know, the thing that respect interdisciplinary research, look at societal impact, not just citations and H index. Because interdisciplinary research, it takes a little longer to get those things. So memo are there, and department heads are supposed to be aware of that. But if you have some good ideas, how will you get the word out? Then go. Thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. But Don actually has a comment online. And as you know, Don was going to be here, but couldn't be. So he said, I'm sorry that my flight was canceled, and I could not participate on this panel. Co-production usually refers to research involving academics and non-academics, not just team science or convergence. There has been reference to the public and policymakers, but how can IHARP co-produce knowledge in this context? So beyond convergence uh, for public policymakers, how can IHARP produce knowledge in this context? So that's something that's something that we all have to think about. Uh, and Don, this is a, a a tough question to come back to, but at the same time, I think one of the examples, at least I mentioned, was around the the virtual reality immersive experience to bring policymakers to the science uh, and make science more uh, communicate, you know, we can communicate it better. I think that would help. Um, I, I, and again, I'm looking at the time, but Andy, I, I want to give you the last last word or Sharad, uh, who was it? Yeah, uh, my question is kind of uh, linked uh, kind of with data and AI. When you talk about raw data in particular, uh, and you're trying to uh, 
find or extract meaningful information out from it. You're looking for AI approaches and other things, right? So, uh, and especially these days when you talk about chat GPT, you can feed in raw data and you can filter out a lot of meaningful answers just by asking, right? So looking at the future where we are going and we are talking about data science and data scientists, uh, do you think uh, AI could replace data scientists in particular uh, when you are talking about data itself? Shashi, do you want to take that from me? <laughs> so, so, so AI debate, you know, at least last year and a half with chat GPT, it has been right wide open and industry has been pushing a perspective which some people are calling AI utopia. And your question is aligned with that AI utopia. And it's great, you know, Silicon Valley can get a lot of money and will create jobs. It's good for a lot of us. And we should certainly strive at that. But if you actually ask people who know the AI technology, you can ask Vipin, you know, he's one of the AI leaders in the room. The answer will come down to the time frame. Is AI really ready? Is that replacement happening in near future? And even I would quote the size AD basically says not yet, right? So a lot of routine things are going to be automated, but there are a lot of things for which you still need a lot more deeper knowledge. Right, but when we are talking about uh, basically filtering out information from the raw data, right? So we're not talking about the whole AI stuff and uh, robots moving around. We're just talking about the techniques of dealing with data, data analysis. So even if you, let's say, for example, you do a user study and you collect data for 300 participants, and you're trying to analyze that data. I'm just talking about that, like a small case. Uh, and if you feed that data itself in ChatGPT, it will take much more less time to extract information. I mean, you can obviously use other analytical tools which come with the quality tricks and survey monkey, which will create automatic graphs for you, but those would be much more faster and quicker. Right, so again, you know, the same question is, you know, uh, there are certain analysis which are very, very well understood, right? You want to find correlations, right? You want to detect objects from the imagery. Uh, you want to maybe find associations. You want to find the trend. There are a lot of common things. You could reasonably well automate that and maybe chat GPT can do that. But remember that data scientists don't add value by doing those routine analysis. They add value by adding the context and the interpretation, right? Was your data complete? Was your data you know, consistent? For example, recently in New Delhi, you saw that they reported a temperature of 53.2, which was never recorded in New Delhi immediately. It made all the newspapers. Newspapers made tons of money. But what happened next? <laughs> they said, oh, look, look, nearby sensors, none of them reported anything above 50. Let's go check it out. And what happened? <laughs> right? The Indian meteorology, right? they withdrew that measurement. But the chat GP and the newspapers, very few of them reported that, right? So it's okay. Data analysis, you want to make quick buck and have a sensational news, go for chat GPT. I'm all for that. Make money. But you want to do serious science you, and you want to save lives, you have to be a little more thoughtful. Yeah. So, Christine, do you want to add? Oh, I just wanted to add, I think it moves the work. It doesn't, it, we will still need armies of those kinds of people. They'll just be doing different things, hopefully more interesting. So one of the things that you've heard about in the morning was also data annotation, garbage in, garbage out. For the types of work that you heard here, it's a long leap, long leap to, to get to that stage. Andy, did you have any question or comment? I know you raised your hand. More of a comment. I calculated the SMB of Greenland using a CNN. If I had said that two years ago, half of the room probably was wondering like, what is SMB and the other half, what is a CNN? Uh, and what you alluded to, you know, the barrier that artificial barrier that we create using that jargon and those uh, acronyms. I, I was just wanted to make a plug that at least within IR, we should try to make an effort to keep reducing that jargon as much as it can in our talks here at um, the all hands meeting and so on. Now, like, you know, 10 years ago, journals were bound by X characters. I don't think we have that anymore. There, there should be no reason to have more and more acronyms in our publications. And I think it would reduce the barrier of access to, to other fields as well, not just our own. Absolutely. I think that's that's a very good point to close on, unless 
our panelists have any final word that they want to share? Any? No, no, we are good. And if you think people will enjoy that AI yes, climate video. Absolutely. So Shashi's new uh, AI Institute has a two minute video that you'll see play here. And then uh, there are posters downstairs. Please walk around. There's food in the back. Grab something. Look at the posters. Uh, there's a poster session again at 5 o'clock. So those two sessions are available for you. And then we'll reconvene here at 3.30. But we'll watch the video as we go.